1971, Hunter S. Thompson took an assignment to write captions for Sports Illustrated's coverage of the Mint 400, a desert off-road race held in Las Vegas. Though Thompson's original 2,500-word manuscript was rejected, he began turning his experience into a novel, documenting the contrast between the American dream image promoted by the Vegas tourism industry and his own darkly comic, drug-induced observations of the town. Fear and loathing in Las Vegas became a pop culture phenomenon and gave a new generation of Americans a darker, more nonsensical conception of what it was like to visit Las Vegas. The circus circus is what the whole half world would be doing on Saturday night if the Nazis had won the war. So you're down on the main floor playing blackjack and the stakes are getting high when suddenly you chance to look up and there, right smack above your head is a half-naked 14-year-old girl being chased through the air by a snarling wolverine. But as the outside perceptions of Las Vegas were changing, so too were the city's internal politics and business methods. After realizing the effect that a respected businessman like Howard Hughes had on buying out many of the mafia elements within the town, government officials decided a change needed to happen. Uh, the state legislature, at the urging of Governor Laxall, passed the corporate gaming law in 1969. And that made it possible for corporations like Hyatt, Hilton, Kokorian's Tracinda Corporation, and others to come into Las Vegas. Headlining the corporate casino's entertainment bills were many well-established acts, most notably the king himself, Elvis Presley. From 1969 to 1977, Presley performed 837 sold-out shows in Las Vegas, making him the symbol of the town, almost iconic today as he was then. Another staple of Vegas entertainment was the town's most extravagant piano player, Liberace, who in 1975 became Vegas's top drawing performer, earning $125,000 a week. Liberace's offstage demeanor was often just as gracious and enthusiastic as his onstage persona, making him a favorite of many other Vegas entertainers. He was good for the industry. He brought something to the table. He didn't just take, and he used beautiful girls and great sets and costumes and cars, and he was just fun. But as audiences flocked to see performers at the new corporate-owned hotels, the last few mob-owned casinos were feeling the heat from the local, state, and federal government. Prosecutors from the organized crime strike force start lopping off the heads, if you will, of Chicago, Kansas City, and Milwaukee organized crime interests. They had uh, set up a, an extreme uh, bugging, uh, bugging system where Telephone conversations in a lot of the major hotels and their executive offices were bugged by the FBI. These investigations led to information about Chicago Mafia associates Frank Lefty Rosenthal and Anthony the Ant Spilatro. In 1973 and 74, a young real estate developer out of Southern California named Alan Glick got more than $60 million in Teamsters pension loans to buy the Stardust, Fremont, and Hacienda. Unknown to the public at the time was the fact that Glick was only a front man for the casinos, which were funneling money into the Chicago mob and were run on a daily basis by Rosenthal. Now he is from Chicago, and since they were kids, he had known Anthony Spilatro. And in the early 70s, Spilatro was sent out to Las Vegas by Chicago, essentially to move into an area that organized crime hadn't been that interested in before, which was street rackets, burglaries, and that sort of thing. In 1974, the Los Angeles Times reported that in the three years Spilatro had been in Las Vegas, more gangland-style murders had been committed there than in the past 25 years combined. This amount of attention was uncommon for most Vegas mobsters, but as Rosenthal secretly ran the casinos and worked the skim for Chicago, he rarely shied away from publicity. Rosenthal did columns for local papers. He had a TV show. This is the kind of thing that guys like Mo Dalitz uh, with the Desert Inn in the old days must have thought utterly ridiculous. Like Bugsy Siegel in the 1940s, Spilatro and Rosenthal's unwillingness to be discreet would lead to their downfall. In 1978, Rosenthal was denied a gaming license and narrowly escaped a 1982 attempt on his life when a car bomb destroyed his vehicle. Spilatro was not so lucky. His name was entered into the Black Book, 
forbidding him entrance to Vegas casinos. He was also brought up on murder charges, and though he was never convicted, it was clear he had gone too far when his battered body was found beside his brothers, buried in an Indiana cornfield. 